Okay. So good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome back to NPTEL live sessions for the course Advanced Transition Metal Organic Chemistry. So today, today's live session is about the week three assignment and the queries that you guys have. So in the last lectures, what we have read about uh, various types of ligands which make the complexes with transition metal. And in the last live session, we covered uh, uh, cyclobutadiene and some part of uh, cyclo pentadiene on the job either. So we just go through all the lectures one by one, uh, which has been covered in week three uh, to gather all the information about the, whatever the basic concepts, ha concepts have been covered. So let's take a look. So the last uh, time we ended up having this kind of uh, orbital symmetry discussion that in cyclopentadiene, uh, diene, all the ligand, comp uh, ligand combination that comes from the salk. Salk is nothing but the symmetry adapt adapted linear combinations. So we have different molecular orbitals which have been linearly combined together to give up these uh, a one combination which is having a particular symmetry. And for example, the first one here, it is A1 symmetry. This will make a uh, bonding. This will involve in sigma bonding. And uh, the one which is represented as E1, having a combination of two molecular orbitals, which could, which are having node equals to one. Nodal plane is one. Here, as you can see, there is only one nodal plane, one up and one down. So the other combination is when we have two nodes, which will form your delta bonding. And this one will give you the pi bonding. And they come under uh, E2, Salk symmetry uh, molecular vitals. So that we read last time. Moving ahead, uh, in V3, cyclobutadiene ligand has been taken into full uh, details. They have, that has been explained by the professor in full detail. So let's just go through these basics once. So as the slide uh, says, we are talking about the bonding properties of the metal metallocene. Metallocene, firstly, we have taken the combination where metallocene, we are talking about the CP rings, which will form a complex with a transition metal giving a metallocene. So here is a ligand, the metal, and possible combinations that has been talked about. So firstly, what has been defined over here, the pi bonding, where the orbitals of the ligand that has been given a particular symmetry, they will be having a nodal pin equals to one, which will combine with or which will interact with the absolutely same symmetry that ligand is having. For example, here, if we have a first combination where we are having these kind of orbitals, they will combine with D by Z of the metal or the other combination, which will combine with the P by of your metal. So P by and D by Z combination will make a pi bonding of the metal with ligand orbitals E1. And similarly, if we have uh, these kind of E1G symmetry and E1, E1U symmetry, so they will combine with DXC and PX. So from here, we got to know for the pi bonding, what are the orbitals are involved? They are DYZ, PY, and DXZ, PX. So these are the uh, orbitals that are involved to have an interaction with ligand to metal. This is an interaction from ligand to metal. And this is the favorite bond, or we can say the strongest bond of pi nature. Normally what happens when we consider any kind of ligand, the trend is sigma would be the strongest followed by the pi and then delta. But here the pi bond is the maximum, having the maximum overlap. That is why it becomes the strongest bond followed by your delta bond. And lastly, it's a sigma bond, which is Actually, we can call it as a zero bonding because the overlap, overlap is minimal. So here it has been shown that pi interaction is favored, which is called the dative bond from ECP. You need to uh, understand the arrow mark, which is going from the ligand to the metal. And it is E1 symmetry uh, adapted orbitals, which is going to AP, DYZ, and DXC. These are the D orbitals, or we can talk about the P orbitals also. Now followed by we have sigma interaction. So what kind of sigma interaction we can assume in metallocene? So ligand would be having this kind of symmetry, which is having nodal plane equals to zero, where electron density is maximum, right? The overlap would be maximum in the orbitals I'm talking about. So what would be the best combination uh, for these kind of orbitals 
to combine properly with the metal so only we have s or vital and dz square which would which would uh, which should give the maximum overlap as uh, we were seeing in other ligand cases and um, the other case is tz tz which is also having the same intermolecular axis and will tend to give the more overlap but actually when we consider these kind of bondings in metal we have seen in the last class that they generally form this cone cone type of shape where metal is in the center so when the ligands these ligands they the ligand orbitals are in the periphery of your cone there is a metal is in the center of your cone so for the sigma kind of interaction the overlap is now minimal almost zero that's why sigma interaction in this metallocene case it becomes a non bonding thing and it is not at all a strong bonding so that's why it is almost zero and the main reason here we are talking about the symmetry and uh, the just a figure uh, thing we have explained over here how the interaction of your ligand orbitals with your metal orbitals is minimal and uh, also if we see the molecular orbital picture where the combinations have been made there is also a to u the second part that becomes a totally non bonding and also the a1 g's are having a large energy difference between the ligand and the metal to have a strong overlap so that becomes another reason followed by these are some few points regarding the metallocene the bonding properties in metallocene so we go by one by one so the bond energy of metallocene does not vary with ligand rotation for example if i'll take a case of ferrocene it can possibly form this uh eclipsed structure let me draw in another slide so normally we come across eclipsed in staggered where the two cp rings they are having zero degree zero degrees uh, phase difference and here it is 180 degrees so if i am taking a case of ferrocene so this is my cp ring so both are in same direction this way so the angle is zero if i have this particular system where they are facing towards each other so the angle becomes 180 degree but what we have seen and what it has been seen by, by performing various experiments and theories so the bond energy of both the eclipsed and the staggered form that remains unchanged so it is it has nothing to do with it that does not uh, get affected similarly eclipsed conformation to its rotameric forms d5h to d5 there is no variation at all in the bond energy only there are the packing forces which will go on ki which conformation it is going to take whether it will be an eclipse or staggered but out of the theoretical calculations on the basis of energies we have found that eclipsed conformation is more stable in ferrocene compared to the staggered so these are the four few bonding properties in metallocene so in lecture 11 it was regarding the molecular orbitals sorry and the various bonding properties that metallocene is having moving towards your lecture 12 which is a full detail of your molecular orbital diagram so here um, they have shown a molecular orbital diagram of ferrocene where you need to know what are the ligand orbitals and what are the metal orbitals that could possibly combine and what could be the possible combinations between the two so you have to jot down all the ligand orbitals and metal orbitals so for that case we need to know what are the ligand orbitals actually so uh here so among the ligand the ligand that we are talking about is cp okay so it is having a e1 and e2 you have seen last time a which is having node equals to 0 and mostly which one will form this combination this is s and dz square and pz orbitals 
the e1 forms mod equals to 1 this is a sigma bonding this will form a pi bonding and the combination comes like dxc dx dyz dy and e2 will be having mod 2 this will give you a delta bonding which i have told you that it is a weaker bonding compared to pi bonding but among all the three sigma pi and delta sigma is the minimal which is the non bonding and here the combinations are dx square y square and dx square right so these are the ligand combinations similarly for metal also Okay. So for metal also, when we are talking about a transition metal, it also comprises of s orbital, p orbital, and d orbital, having a combination of a one g. I am talking about the symmetry also. p orbitals will give you so among this is px py and pz they will form e1 u and this will give you a2 u u is basically because of angirard that means there is no center of symmetry or center of inversion in this For example, if I will take a case of sphere that self uh, s orbital that is completely spherical, so it is totally totally symmetry. That is why Girard comes for symmetry. Therefore, these energy terms or terminology that you that actually come from the group theory, then you will learn in some different courses. So here in P X, if I will draw one, one lobe is positive other is negative so there is no symmetry symmetry we call when upper half and the lower half is same similarly in d orbitals they are girard orbitals where if i'll take an example of dxy so this lobe now if you'll see this is symmetric opposite half if you go from center there to the opposite half that is coming the symmetrical that's why this is a girard and every notation will be having g sign now d orbitals when we were talking about so the d orbitals is having the combination of firstly pz square which is your a to u dz square which is your a one b sorry because this is girard system a one g and uh, followed by your dxc and dyz they will form e1g and dx square y square and dx5 will form e2g so these are the combination these are the orbitals which are present in metal and uh, uh, other d orbitals that ligand orbitals you have already seen ki how it is uh, combining now here in the molecular diagram also it has been explained if i'll just so here as you can see this side is the ligand and this is your metal now your metal orbitals are having more energy compared to your ligands so they are been shown at a higher uh, energy level so here firstly it is from this is your sigma bonding orbitals this is your pi orbitals this is your delta bonding orbitals of the ligand we are talking about the total linear combination of those orbitals have been given over here and similarly on the metal side since it is it would be having a 3d 4s 4p if i am taking a 3d combination that will not involve the sp which are inner that that will going to involve your outer 
uh, S and P orbitals. That's why D followed by S and P. Now D, I have already uh, shown what is the combination. Uh, it is having A one G, E one G, and E two G. Similarly, the S orbital is having A one G, just one case, and P is having A two U and E one U, which I have already discussed. Now we will understand how the combinations is happening. Firstly, we have to see this A one G. The A one G of the ligand has to mix with or interact with the A one G of a metal. And A one G is present in two cases. Firstly, here, and the second one is here. So it is having one combination which is closer to energy. Sorry. So it will form a bonding orbital here, A one G, with this A one G, and uh, corresponding the non bond uh, anti bonding of it is lying over here. So the combination is like this: A one G and A one G or This is from D orbital, and this is from its. So here it will give you combination of orbitals. Will atomic orbitals will always give you the corresponding molecular orbitals, and this is A one G. This is bonding molecular orbital, and A one G star star is for your anti bonding molecular orbital. Similarly, when we have A one G here also, it will. Combine with this particular thing and give an A one G star over here because it is having more energy. So as you can see, the energies of A one G with S and D of the metal it's high in nature and the overlap becomes very less. It's very less feasible. And similarly, the other sigma bonding A to U that remains anti bonding because here it is firstly in D orbitals there is no symmetry of A, A like A, A to U and the symmetry. Which is present in P, which is A to U, that is having the highest energy gap of ligand orbital and the metal orbital. That's why the combination becomes uh, that. That's why the interaction becomes the minimal. And here we say that sigma bonding is zero. Sigma bonding is minimal, which is not having any interaction. So that, therefore, this becomes your non-bonding nature. I hope it has. It is clear now. Moving ahead, we have the pi, pi orbital combination. Now we need to look from your ligand. This symmetry is matched, has to be matched with the orbitals of your metal. So E one G and E one U. Firstly, we will see here, which is at the lowest energy. So it is having E one G. So therefore, it will give you E one G bonding here and E one G anti bonding here. Similarly, E one U will come here, but E one U is not a part of D orbital. It is in P orbital, so it will form. Bonding here and anti bonding will go here. This side. So now this one is clear. Now moving ahead, we have uh, delta bonding E two G and E two U, and we need to see which combination is possible among all of them. E two G is present, but E two U is not. So therefore, we will form it as a non bonding itself. Like it will not bond with any because the symmetry E two U is not present in metal. Whereas E two G will bond here as a uh, bonding molecular orbital with the orbitals and give an anti bonding e to g star so this is the combination and at last we uh, have e1 g e2 u e1 g e1 u e2 g followed by e1 g star e1 g star e2 u e1 g star or if You do not want to go any further, so we can end up over here. So the general configuration comes in this particular region, where we have A one G A two U, E one G E one U E two G, A one G star and E one G star. So here we have to fill our our electrons to get a particular electronic configuration. So if we have okay, so now. So now here, now since we have understood the molecular orbital diagram, how the orbitals are combining together to give you molecular orbitals, uh, and we'll define your electronic configuration. So here are different properties uh, and certain points regarding those molecular orbitals. So weakly bonding and non-bonding nature of E two and E one, as we have already told, uh, molecular orbitals calls for the existence of metallocenes with less eighteen electron uh, valence electron. So, except the case of the ferrocene, which is eighteen valence electron, rest are the metallocenes, which is uh, manganese seventeen electron, chromium sixteen, and uh, vanadium fifteen. 
yeah they are having no outside charge so they will form less uh, valence electron complex compared to because a1 and e2 they are not having much uh, bonding nature they are almost having non bonding nature or weak, weak bonding nature so because of that uh, their total valence electron count uh, decreases moving ahead now uh, in certain cases you will see okay we have a certain electronic configuration that we need to follow but for example if at the last what we were writing that uh, we are having here a1 g a2 u and so on and so forth suppose i have at last i have four electrons and i need to fill them fill in these two but i am not able to fill in these two so i have four electrons lastly filled so all the four can be filled here and it could be zero but there is also combinations where this is three and this is one so how do we determine that what kind of electronic configuration the particular metal osin is going to um, follow that will be depending uh, depending upon their magnetic and electronic properties so if it is having a certain magnetic moment depending upon the number of electrons and unpaired electrons that would vary and the combination would vary and that sequence will come from your quantum chemical method uh, for example in this particular slide it has been shown i'll just zoom in so here you can see if we have uh, cp2v many combinations are possible so if we have cp2v so since it is having three unpaired electrons so it could have filled in e2g3 but for the case where we have we need to have the maximum stability or this kind of electronic configuration it follows this rule that e2g2 and a1g1 uh, similarly if we have chromium thing so one chrome three are there as you can see three unpaired electrons two unpaired electrons so etg2 one where et e2 et2g uh, et 2g3 and a1g star 1 so these are the combinations which have come from the quantum chemical method so we need to know what are the configuration is possible so uh, in lecture 11 and 12 we got to know about the molecular vitals and uh, how the combinations are being made from the ligand to metal what kind of interactions we have seen and uh, what is the electronic configuration of different metal osine we have seen that and how it varies when we have different depending on their electronic configuration we get uh, electronic and magnetic properties different now the 13th lecture was about their reactivity how they react so as you know that uh, ferrocene is having that cp rings the cp rings are having an ionic charge the, every carbon is having an ionic charge and uh, the negative charge which makes them uh, highly neutrophilic and therefore they will give you a uh, very good properties of an electrophilic substitution reactions and uh, for example it's an electrophile and this is having a negative charge this will attack over here and itself can gain positive but we have hydrogen over here which can leave out and therefore the charge gets balanced and it becomes aromatic again and therefore the electrophile so the h positive has been replaced by the e positive and that's why it is called as electrophilic substitution reactions and also these are redox stable they won't go to uh, fe2 and fe3 until and unless there is some uh, moiety present which can oxidize it so on its own it is having the high redox activity just like the other uh, benzene organic moiety but we have seen that compared to benzene thing ferrocene is more uh, active towards electrophilic uh, reactions for example ferrocenyl amine is strongly basic then aniline so ferrocenyl amine is nothing but your this structure where you have an nh2 group over here so this is having a lone pair which is involved in your uh, cp ring similarly the way we have nh2 so this is a six member this is a five member but because of high negative charge on the cp rings this becomes highly basic in nature compared to your normal aniline similarly formic acid becomes weaker acid uh, than the benzoic acid so we have benzoic acid and if i'll take one part over here i will see over one oh so this becomes a weaker acid so it needs to 
take up the electrons first moiety should be connected to the carbon to take up the electrons to have a good release what is the good acid or weak or strong acid strong acid and weak acid is dependent on the ability to lose your h positive to give h positive very easily but since this negative is there in the cc ring which is giving electrons to it now it is not taking much electrons from oh and therefore h the uh, tendency of uh, losing an h positive is very less where compared to here benzene will take up the electrons which is towards itself and therefore here the bond will get cleave and h will be released as h positive that's why uh, the reactivity of ferrocene be it basic nature or some moieties which are having the acidic nature they are in both the sense uh, highly reactive compared to the their counter uh, benzene uh, moiety so one of such examples is friedel craft isolation reaction you have seen this is in this occurs in uh, benzene also in the same reagent uh, in the presence of same reagent CH3C double bond OCl and its AlCl3 which is the weak acid so this cp ring which is the anionic and therefore this will attack on the carbonyl position and it will get this COCH3 and uh, the monomer is also possible and like di substitution is also possible mono substitution and di substitution that is the right term so where you now here your electrophile is ch3 c double bond o cl because cl is a very good leaving group in presence of this yes acid so this can attack over here or else i will show in the table okay so we have ch3 c double bond o cl and alcl3 can take up the cl and form alcl4 negative and since it is having if you see like this so this will attack on carbonyl this will go oxygen ka negative will come back and therefore cl will leave out and therefore this position will be having c double bond o ch3 so this is how it works for the electrophilic substitution reactions now we will move further and uh, we'll see the activity of ferrocene if the electrophile used is an oxidizing agent then the substitution reaction will be suppressed by the formed ferrocene ion so this is true because uh, when we have a uh, oxidizing agent which we will see in the next reaction it will tend to oxidize the ferrocene compared to having an electrophilic uh, substitution reaction and the electrophile attacks in exo position we have exo and endo position it's similar like nt and sin uh, thing so this is kind of nt and this is sin so you know better of uh, understanding for example in this reaction we have a strong oxidizing agent which will convert to c double bond o uh, moiety and uh, which uh, here the moiety of this is in exo position this is an endo and as you can see it has been found that endo will give you the slow reaction compared to the exo isomer moving ahead one named reaction is there a uh, manic reaction which is nothing but your amino methylation and uh, this will give you a condensation and will form ch2 over here with the loss of water water will be lost and we will be having ch2 and ch3 ch3 now we have in lecture 40 we have continued the reactivity of the ferrocene so here we have a uh, ferrocene and it is saying that how the reaction will continue to occur in presence of lithium butyl lithium which is a strong uh, lithiating agent so multiple lithiation met uh, methylation uh, or lithiation hampers the reaction so that we don't want firstly the first step would be uh, to react ferrocene with a butyl ethyl in presence of thf or hexane in maintaining the low temperature that we need to maintain and in presence of this reagent which is tin chloride and this becomes a, again an electrophile as soon as we will be having the lithium over here that lithium chloride will go out and sn butyl uh, uh, tributyl will be coming over here so this will give you a mixture of products 33% would be unreacted ferrocene 60% would be your mono substituent and 7% is only your uh, di substituent so this particular method is very useful to uh, 
form uh, a kind of like to avoid the multi mutation also now uh, when we have that sn or lithium over there if it uh, if it reacts with your iodine or sn butyl is there which reacts with your iodine it will take a one iodine and one iodine will come on this position and uh, similarly this particular compound is even more helpful in giving you a ryl substitution this is called a coupling reaction and it is named as to where the complex which has been used is a palladium complex where oxidative addition followed by the reductive elimination it will give you an ar any aromatic moiety which can which you want to attach over there now uh, for the reactions if it reacts with butyl lithium it will give you a lithium over here and uh, it will leave as sn butyl 4 and when it will react with a phosphine it will take up the lcl will come out and pkh2 will come out so how the substitution occurs and we can change the different substitutions followed by uh, different schemes but your main compound is to have this uh, sn butyl group over there which can facilitate your uh, further substitution moving towards we have another reaction where if we need to have a lithium and uh, on this position it has happened with respect to with by using a tomato which is a tetra methyl ethylene diamine and the structure of this is so these are the methyl groups so 1 2 3 4 tetra methyl this is 1 2 ethyl diamine so this becomes a very strong base to take up the proton and therefore you get a lithium with the a uh, di substitution and this is only stabilized when we have tetra in our reaction mixture so you have to maintain this particular temperature now uh, we have seen how the ligands have been taken into picture now move firstly we saw the sandwich complexes where the uh, metallocene we were talking about where both the sides we have cp ring but this could also be possible that one side we have cp other side we don't have cp ring so other sides we have different ligands that's why it is called as heteroleptic also if we have both sides uh, same ligand then it is called homoleptic so how we can go from uh, metal is seen to a uh, half sandwich complex or sandwich complex to the half sandwich complex so here is one reaction where um, iron carbonyl or ruthenium carbonyl has been used and they have been treated with a cyclopentadienyl ring which will give you this kind of moiety and on the uh, further loss of carbon monoxide it will attain its eta 5 right now it's eta 4 uh, with the loss of h2 it will give you a dimer so these are the reactions which was uh, found in 1990 similarly if we made a metal carbonate directly to or react with the cyclopentadienyl ligand where uh, this is a cp star cp star is nothing but where every carbon is substituted uh, with every hydrogen is substituted with methyl and in presence of light it will release its c carbonyl and so this reaction is like two molecules of uh, this particular complex when it undergoes uh, for the loss of carbon monoxide this will give you a dimer having rhenium and rhenium three bonds this this will we will take up later now the last lecture of the week 3 was about the preparation of uh, metal uh, cyclopentadienyl carbonyl complexes so there are certain other methods also where we have a ven pentanyl carbonyl uh, vanadium uh, carbonyl complex with a negative charge outside because thorium is positive in presence of this c5h5 hgcl where hg which is 2 plus in nature it gets reduced to hg0 that means it's a strong oxidizing agent and when we have a strong oxidizing agent we will form the c5h5 vanadium and with the loss of nacl with carbonyl the other preparation method we have is treating it with nac5h5 the preparation of nac5h5 we have seen in last lectures this will give you this with the further uh, protonation how the sodium is being replaced by your h or uh, when we have uh, iron in plus 3 it will act as a strong oxidizing agent and will release h2 and uh, this will form a dimer so it can go to it can further reduce itself and can 
uh, donate electrons to and can take up the electrons from tungsten to give a dimer. So the hydride complex decomposes upon exposure to give the release of H2 that has been shown over here. And the carbonyl methylate undergoes direct oxidative dimerization. So this is called oxidative dimerization, where in presence of oxidative aging, that iron-3, which has a tendency to get reduced easily, and uh, therefore it will form a dimer. Followed by we have uh, this reaction also where how the carb uh, chloride is being taken by the this allium and CP rings comes into picture. Followed by how we are reducing it in the presence of reducing agent. So it will it is having uh, titanium in plus four and uh, how it is reducing in plus two form. This is plus four to plus two and uh, we have carbonyl and um, and this will be Zinc is going from 0 to plus 2 because this is zinc NH3 and outside it is 2 chloride. And uh, how titanium is going from plus 4 to plus 2, this is called in presence of the reducing agent in carbonyl. Another same reaction that uh, we have seen how it is forming and uh, how the structures, these are called half sandwich uh, structures. And moreover, we have seen the reactivity also of these compounds where we have one CP ring and carbonyl the other side. So in presence of uh, sodium amalgam, it will form this kind of uh, complex with the loss of carbonyl. And uh, similarly, uh, cyclopentadienyl iron carbonyl is made to react with sodium amalgam. It will give you the species and uh, from dimer to it becomes a monomer. With the reaction of methyl uh, iodide, it will release sodium iodide and methyl get coordinated to the iron because it is having a negative charge. So this will react easily with any, with any M positive. So M positive and X negative, X negative will be taken up by the sodium. So, so with that, uh, these are the basic concepts that have been covered in uh, lecture from lecture 11 to lecture uh, 15 in B3. Now we will uh, quickly take up the questions of the assignment. Okay, so here are the questions. Uh, the first question that we have is uh, the metal orbitals that can interact in a pi fashion. Firstly, you need to know the pi fashion they are talking about with the following ligand orbitals in a dicyclopentadienyl transition metal sandwich complex. So this MCP and CP, the same way that we have talked about. So the orbitals also they have given and they are asking about what are the combinations of so this pi fashion, this is the orbitals of the ligand, right? And we need to find out which orbital will be forming a pi bonding with the metal orbital. We have already seen, uh, we have already talked about this thing that in case of metal, how the combination uh, occurs. So for uh, sigma bonding, Okay, so, so for sigma uh, bonding, for metal, it will be having an S orbital, the PZ orbital and DZ square orbital. And in ligand, we have already seen it will be having a symmetry of A1. For pi bonding, it will be having a combination of PX, DXC, PY, dyz and this will be combining with e1 and for delta bonding it is having a combination of uh, dx square y square and dxy with e2 symmetry of the ligand so these are the combinations which will form a sigma pi and delta bonding and we need to find that pi has been asked so this pi as you can see over here this is a e1 
where it is having only one node, which is going through here and here also it is having this node. So here it is having node from this side and here it is having node from this side. So both are having the uh, node equals to one. So therefore this becomes two different atomic orbitals which have been linearly combined because they are having node equals to one and they are giving the symmetry of E1. So they will form pi fashion. And now we need to out to the four options. Firstly, we need to find out which one will form the pi bonding. So C option is clearly simple that dz square will always form the sigma bonding. So this is not an option. Rest of our dyz, px, and dxc, all of them, they will combine in a pi fashion with this particular uh, thing. So therefore, we have the options A, B, and D. All of them are correct. So they will form the pi bonding with this particular uh, orbital having E1 symmetry. So the next question is the number of metal ligand uh, interactions So the number of metal ligand sigma interaction possible in C5, H5 moiety in the metal, as you have already known that we have only A1 in the ligand and A1 symmetry has to be present in uh, your metal. So only one sigma bond is possible, which is uh, itself is very weak or we can call it as a non-bonding. So the answer is only one sigma bond occurs between CP and your metal. Okay. Now we have third question. This is also related to your uh, molecular vital because it's a molecular vital understanding. It's a tedious job. So if you understand it very well, you can answer all the questions very easily. So the question says ligand orbitals that can interact in a pi fashion again. Now we need to find out the ligand orbitals. The first question was the metal orbitals. The ligand orbitals were given. Here the metal orbitals have been given and you need to find out the ligand orbitals. With the metal orbitals in a dicyclopentadienyl transition metal sandwich complexes, again it has been given. Now they have reversed the question. Firstly also it was a pi fashion, but ligand orbitals were given. And you need to, you were being asked to find out the metal orbital. Now here the metal orbitals have been given. You need to find out the ligand orbitals. Now look at the metal orbitals. It is a combination of DXC and PX. And itself from the pi fashion, we know that it will, it should have node equals to one. It can't be having node equals to two. So firstly, we will see the combinations. Here in above case, it is having a, uh, This is one and itself it is having two. So node is equals to two. Here, if we see there is only one node, there is also only one node. So node is equals to one. So this will form. Here we have similarly. Yeah. So this is also node one, and this is your node equals to zero because all the orbitals are in same uh, form. They are not uh, having any upper and uh, down lobe in different forms. So B and C your right options. And also we have discussed earlier that for the pi fashion, E1 symmetry has to be matched with your uh, metal orbitals. So what is the E1 symmetry? You can just see around. This is E1, U and E1G. Both can combine uh, with the metal orbitals to give you pi uh, fashion, where E2G will give you the delta bonding. And this will give you the sigma bonding. OK. Now the next question is the electronic configuration of the ground state of CP2V complex. Firstly, we need to find out the total valence electron count of CP2V. So CP is your five electron, 
multiplied by two. Vanadium is having atomic number of five, so it is five electrons. This is a 15 electron complex and you need to fill 15 electrons. So the general electronic configuration that we have seen in case of metallocenes, is A1G followed by A2U, then E1G, E1U, E2G, A1G, star, so and so forth. So for 15 electrons, it could be enough. So firstly, A1G can accommodate two electrons, A2, A2 also can accommodate two electrons because this is single uh, orbital. This can accommodate four, this also can accommodate four, this can accommodate four, but now the question comes four plus four plus four, that is 12. And now we need to fill three electrons. So the combination for vanadium, it is EG, E, T2, E, 2, G, 2, 2, and A1, G star one. So this is the combination which has been calculated from quantum chemical method where all the three should not be placed in E2, G, but one is in the antimony. And that leads to its different uh, properties, both in magnetic and uh, electric, uh, electric properties. So that's why the combination for CP2V is the B option. Moving ahead, the reactivity question has come now. The fifth question says the product of the following reaction is. So you have been given a ferrocene, which is in an eclipsed form. So iron is in plus two state. We have first is tertiary butyl lithium in presence of THF or hexane at a very low temperature, followed by butyl, uh, tributyl thin chloride. And we have already seen that this is a electrophile. And here, in presence of this particular uh, position, then firstly lithium will take place and uh, butyl thin will come into picture. So firstly, we will get our, when the two steps would happen, we will be having SN here and butyl here. The last step, what it is asking, is asking iodination. So I2 in presence of dichloromethane. So this will give us SN butyl and iodide and one iodine will come to this particular position. So now there could be a possibility. So this was the first step, but there are two more steps. So this is not an option. This could be the option, but uh, here uh, we have seen that this will form, this product will form in 60 percentage. And from 60 only, you can get this mono form, which the thing which is having a dimer, di substitution, that is already in less quantity. So this is already in seven percentage, how it will go and give you the di substitution over here. So only this could be possible. That's why we have eliminated the option. Both are having RD. Now you need to eliminate the option. Since this product itself will form as a 7%, so it will be very less feasible to have di substitution of iodine. So therefore, C is the right option. Now the uh, sixth question that we have is, we need to find out the metal-metal bond order in the following complex. So firstly, we will understand how do we calculate the metal-metal bond order. That means how many bonds are being formed in the metal. Between two metals, we need to find out. Uh, sorry. So metal-metal bond order that we have to calculate. 
so eta 5 c5 ne5 and rhenium complex has been given so to, to in order to calculate the number of bond order that we are talking about here is it's like whether it is forming a one bond two bond three bond so on so forth they've been single double triple or and so on so forth so we have this complex first you will see c5 in e5 this is two in number rhenium 2 carbon 3 so this is basically a dimer okay so now uh, we need to know that this complex forms a 36 valence electron or for one rhenium it is 18 valence electron total so therefore we need to take the combination five electrons from c5 h any uh, five into two rhenium will give you uh, seven electrons so seven into two carbonyl whether it is in bridging form whether it is in terminal its total count is two so two into three it should be 36 but we are missing here the number of metal metal bonds so x we take it as metal metal bond order so if we calculate it it comes as 10 plus 14 plus 6 plus x equals to 36 this is nothing but a uh, 30 x 36 x is equals to 36 minus 30 x comes as 3 so one bond is equals to two electrons and if we have six if we have three bonds that would be six electrons therefore the six electrons is equals to three bonds and your metal metal bond order in rhenium complex is three basically where the complex structure is rhenium three metal bonds over here two carbonyl three carbonyls are there and one cp star ring So this is where we were we need we were being asked either you know the structure but if you need to calculate if you know the total valence electron count there from there also you can uh, assume uh, x your take x as your metal metal bond order and calculate the total valence electron count and uh, equate it with the total number which is 36 if it is 18 valence electron then you have to have that 18 valence electron but for 18 valence electron it is not possible to have any bond order because that would exist for only one metal now the another question that we have is the solid state structure of uh, cp nickel carbonyl 2 complex is so we need to find out what is the structure solid state structure of this particular compound so different combinations are being given if you see in all the cases there is no mistake two cps are there two nickel centers are there two carbonyls are there so how do we find out firstly the cp and i co whole two for that matter also we need to know how many metal metal bonds are there and uh, how they are combining so if we have 5 plus 10 Plus two, whole multiplied by two. Plus x is your metal metal bond order, and total has to be thirty six. So this is seventeen plus two, thirty four plus x equals thirty six. X equals to two. So this two electrons correspond to one bond. therefore we got the structure as nickel is binding with nickel 1 cp with sorry for the structure other cp there so since we are having two cp if i will give two over here so actually it exists as a bridging thing where the carbonyl is giving one electron one electron to both sides this will be having one electron 
in each combination to nickel nickel and here also and this is five this is 10 and therefore it becomes a total combination of an 18 electrons so this is the right option that it exists because not this one because it is not having a metal metal bond it is not having metal metal interaction whereas it is having a metal and four bonds so four bonds are required to be made with knight uh, nickel so that's why it is having this bridging structure with the four bonds because it has to see its stability also or you can form this way or you can form it this way both are fine both are fine so this is how we calculate uh, the solid state structure we can determine we can eliminate the two options first can't be the option b can't be the option because there is no direct nickel nickel bond but we have calculated that nickel nickel bond exists that is having bond order of one now out of the c and d options uh, both are having nickel nickel bond but and also the co and cp is fine but why not this structure and this structure because it has to complete its coordination number also so here its coordination number is four whereas it is three and nickel tends to form this four in number therefore the d option is correct i hope you have understood <clears throat> now the again question has uh, come the number of uh, metal metal bond in the solid state structure of cp nickel carbonyl 2 is so the earlier question was ki we need to find out the solid structure of uh, cp and i co whole 2 we are now we need to find out the number of metal metal bonds so how do we do that firstly again we need to see we need to calculate the total because outside is two and we consider the number of metal metal bonds at x 36 So this will be a seventeen electron multiplied by two plus x is thirty six. Thirty four plus x equals to thirty six and x equals to two. So the two electrons will correspond to one metal metal bond. If we have x equals to four, this will correspond to metal metal double bond. X equals to c triple bond and so on so forth because one bond. comprising of two electrons so the question was we need to find out the number of metal metal bond in the solid state structure of cp nickel co whole twice which is one and the structure that we have already seen it forms nickel one bond with nickel one cp is here co which is in bridging the other co is also in bridging with the nickel so this is the structure and this is your metal metal bond now we have a ninth question which is being stated as the oxidation state of the metal in cp osmium carbonyl you need to find out so first in this case either you know the total valence electrons of your complex or you know the solid state structure of it so we actually know that osmium and osmium are having a single bond with cp and cp two cos and since by there is no bridging because of the size of osmium size is very big and carbonyls are very small so if we have an osmium which is this big size the carbonyl which is connected to one osmium could not able to bind with the second osmium which was not the case with the nickel because the size of 3d orbitals is smaller compared to your 4d and 5d that's why it is not having any bridging and therefore now you can see it is having 
one direct bond with osmium and one bond with CP. So both are osmium because of the CP, they exist in plus one nature. Because CP is minus one, so this will become plus one. This is minus one, this is plus one. Also, you can cross calculate via, cal via oxidation method, where you can calculate their number of electrons. And now we are at our last question, which is we need to find out the number of terminal carbonyl in the solid state structure of CP nickel complex. The same complex has been asked in four or five questions where it has, the question is a bit different. Firstly, it has been asked about the solid state structure, then the metal metal bonds. Now they're asking for the carbonyl terminal carbon. So we know that carbonyl can be binded in a terminal fashion or as a bridging fashion. In terminal, that means it is connected with only one metal. In bridging, it is connected with more than one metal. So we already know that nickel is having this solid state structure. Where both the carbonyls are in bridging form. So there is no terminal of carbonyl. So therefore the answer is terminal carbon is equal to zero. So uh, these were the 10 questions from the week assignment. I would happy to answer your questions if you guys have any question or query, or if you want me to repeat from the starting, because we have still one hour of time, so we can go through the questions one, one more time. So right now I can see Lazima. Hello, Lazima. Uh, can you hear me? Hello. So we will quickly go to uh, all the questions uh, one more time. Uh, how the questions have been asked and uh, what approach we need to use to complete and to get the answer. So the first question that was about, uh, we have already seen in the lectures that uh, metallocene orbital con contribution and everything has been given. Okay, great. So uh, I think you have joined a bit late. So I would uh, go through all the questions one by one. If you have any doubt anywhere, you just, uh, can unmute yourself or you can just put the message in chat box. I would love to answer your question. So this is the this is the questions that are from week three assignment. And I have explained all the basics already. Uh, this video would be there on the YouTube. You can go back and uh, see and uh, see the videos and uh, if you have any other doubt, you can uh, ask me in the next uh, live session that will be held on uh, Tuesday. So this one, here in the week three assignments, the first question was, and more or less all the questions were about uh, how the orbitals are reacting, which combinations we have to look into picture, how do we need to calculate the metal-metal bond order, which is very, very important in case of transition metal uh, complexes. So the first question was that um, if we have uh, metal orbitals which are interacting, we have the ligand orbitals which are interacting in phi, uh, phi fashion. So you need to find out which are the possible and good combination to react in a pi fashion with the ligand orbitals. So this was the pi orbital. I hope you have gone through the lectures. So I will just repeat it one more time. So these are basically the combinations of the ligand and the metals. To form the sigma bonding, we need to have S orbital or PZ orbital or DZ square orbital of the metal uh, to combine with A1. So A1 is nothing but your orbital of ligand, that CP ligand we are talking about, where the there is no node. Node is nothing but the probability having uh, the probability of having zero electron density. So since it is having all the lobes facing down or other combination could be where they all are facing towards up. So there is no plane, there is no node, which is not bisecting the two uh, lobes or one lobe into two halves. So therefore this will form a sigma. And the A1, E1 is nothing but your uh, symmetry adapted linear combination of 
atomic orbitals i hope you have uh, read the lectures if you want to stop me in between if you want me to further go into the details you can just put a message in the chat box so that i can uh, be knowing ki if you really know all these things or not or you can just continue to go further sorry ma'am i have some network issues oh, uh, that is a, that is no problem uh, are you aware of these combinations in the begin have you gone through the lectures sorry i didn't get lectures okay you have not seen the lectures okay so i would suggest you um, anyhow we will see all the uh, questions over here i would suggest you to go back and download those videos or to see the lectures first and then try to solve the assignment by yourself so that you will be know how to what kind of questions are being asked so i will give you just a brief combination uh, brief of the what is the lecture that we have talked about so far so we are actually basically looking for the this kind of ligand this is called a cp which is cyclo penta dienyl ligand this is basically having a charge of 1 and uh, why the charge of 1 if you can see it would be having five electrons and one electron when it is been given it forms a resonance so this will come as a resonance and this becomes a six electrons and therefore it is aromatic in nature this becomes a highly negative and uh, very good nucleophile or ligand we can say to connect or to interact with your transition metal which are having metals in their higher oxidation states or any oxidation state so we are looking into the orbital picture of the ligands and what are the to form any complex ligand orbitals have to be similar to that of your metal com, uh, orbitals for example if i have in ligand if i have this which i was showing you earlier this kind of combination where all the loads you can consider it as a positive half on the negative half so positive negative they are bit symmetrical over here so they will give you a symmetry of a1 and it will give better combination with s orbitals of your metal because s orbital is spherical so when s orbital one orbital which is spherical and another orbital is there which is of this form so they can combine with this particular thing and there would be a very good overlap that is a general assumption i'm talking about if you have a pi bonding you want to make for that pi bonding it should be having a head on head overlap that means these heads should overlap together so there is no maximum overlap over there so basically on this particular uh, category we have s orbitals p orbitals d orbitals of the metals and similarly ligands are having certain combinations and we need to find out the best combination of both of them to get a better interaction that's why the question was about this was the orbital of the ligand where uh, we have e1 symmetry when you go back to the lecture you will get to know about it because right now explaining this won't be uh, much useful i will i will only tell about here ki if i i am containing this field one as a positive and this empty one as negative so this has nothing to do it is just the notation of the loads which are the orbital no, or no, nodes so we have this combination and if other loads are down and this is up so they are having a plane when plane first half is reflected by the other half and similarly this is happening here where they are up and here they are uh, the negative ones are up and here the positive ones are up so they are possibly giving your pi fashion geometry pi pi kind of bonding and you need to find out which is the metal orbital which can connect with them very easily so as we have already discussed that pz square will form your sigma bond the rest of our dz square or s orbital or pz orbital they will form your sigma bonding this is the table so sigma s uh, s orbital pz and dz square will give you the sigma bonding px dx uh, px or dx uh, dx z py or dy z will give you pi bonding and dx square y square and dx y will give you the delta bonding 
so that's why we need to find out now we were talking about the pi combination we need to find out the pi orbital so these are the three possible combinations Ma'am, can Ajay? you explain what is delta bonding okay so delta bonding delta. is nothing but when your four lobes are involved in the picture so out of your uh, first is the delta bonding will come into picture when you have mod equals to 2 so for example here if i have this ligand so these are your orbitals so firstly if positives are down and here the positive are up so i hope you understand the meaning of node where the node is occurring here there is only one node node is nothing but a plane which will uh, give you like uh, your electron density gets cancelled so node exists when electron density gets cancelled that means positive and negative are in opposite phase so here as you can see this neg positive and positive are here so therefore there is a uh, plane which can give you the positive and positive on the alternate side so similarly these kind of ligands will give you a pi orbital because the node is one now if next combination if you have there one is up one is down this is up this is down or you can take it in of this side this angle now here also the plane is existing and here also the plane is existing because it is having cross combination with this also it is having cross combination with this also now the node becomes two so there exists two planes which are cancelling out the electron density field that's why this this kind of uh, orbitals will make a delta bonding so the for delta bonding we need to first have a condition of node equals to 2 for the ligands so the delta bonding and metal orbitals should be having four lobes in each so here comes the picture of dx square y square and dxy so these are having four lobes and they can better interact in the ligands which are having the node equals to 2 so dx square y square if i'll explain to you x and y so they are having this kind of picture and dx y they will be in between the axis they are along the axis lobes and they are in between the axis so these are the only two d orbitals which will form delta bonding with your ligand having mod equal to 2 and this is also part of uh, bonding when we have sigma bonding when we have pi bonding and third one when we have a delta bonding where d orbitals having the four four lobes they get into the picture and form an interaction with the ligands that is called the delta bonding and out of the three this is the weakest but in case of the metallo series where you have a cp cp on both the sides there the trend is sigma is the weakest followed by delta followed by pi so the pi bonding is the maximum compared to your delta one and compared to your sigma one so now is it uh, understood ma'am why did you select the d orbital x as a dx y dx square minus y square and dx y uh, if Because any importance no no i see uh, already the other orbitals because these combinations what we have taken over here they have already involved in certain bonds as you can see because of their symmetry or the kind of bonding uh, the kind of orbital shapes they are having they are already involved in certain bonds for example dz square so dz square is because of its high symmetry it comes and bind is as a sigma bonding rest of part dxc and yz which are having the internuclear axis already they will form the pi bond and what are the other left we have d orbitals five in combination three have already been used what are the two left which are having the four lobes and they they are meant to give you the delta one that's why this combination comes into picture okay thank you ma'am thank you because for uh, 
uh, there are certain rules that sigma bonding should be having your uh, highest symmetry. They should be having the maximum overlap, which is not happening in metallocene case uh, because of the geometric constraints. But normally, sigma bonding is maximum. So DZ square, one option is out because that would be having a, uh, this kind of uh, shape. So the negative would be in the center and the positive over here. So this is having a maximum overlap. Rest in part, for the pi bonding, you need to have one of your new internuclear axis in your x, uh, this d orbital. For example, if you are taking combination of Px, so dx is there, z should also be there for better combination. This is uh, Py and dyz would be the other combination. You cannot take dxy because here the internuclear axis is not there. Generally, when we talk about the axis, that is your internuclear axis. Right? So for pi bonding, to have that kind of orbital combinations, you need to have your internuclear axis in your d orbitals. And when three combinations have already been used, then what is left? dx square, y square, and dxy, which are actually interconvertible to each other by a rotation of 90 degrees, and they form this delta one. Okay. Okay. So uh, this was the first question where uh, we know that what kind of ligand orbitals will be interacting with your metal uh, center. And uh, here, when it is being talked about the pi orbitals, we need to look around what are the pi orbitals of the metal which can interact with it. So as I told, dyz and dxz, because that is the intermediate axis, they will form the pi bonding. And px already we have uh, taken into picture. Now the next question was, uh, how many metal ligand sigma interactions are possible in C5, H5 moiety and the metal? We have already uh, we have already seen that one sigma bond is possible in uh, case of CP because only when you go back and see the molecular vital diagram, there's only one bond which is possible, which is even weak because of what happens when metal is here and metallocenes, they tend to form a conical shape. So your ligand orbitals are at the circumference of the periphery of your uh, cone, whereas the metal is in the center. So the interaction becomes almost a perpendicular thing. They are not parallel to each other. They don't overlap much. That's why the sigma bond becomes the weakest. Still, we can't uh, ignore the fact that sigma bond does exist and there is only one sigma bond. In all the cases, there is only one sigma bond. So that's why uh, the number of metal ligand sigma interaction is one. Now moving ahead, the next question was again based on the pi fashion. Earlier it was being asked the metal orbital we need to find out. Here the ligand orbitals we need to find out. So the pi fashion, they have already given dxe, px are the metals uh, which are going to make a pi bonding. What are the ligand orbitals? In ligand orbitals, we need to see the number of nodes. For example, here, positive is here, positive is here, negative and negative and positive here. So there is one uh, node over here because positives are on the opposite direction. So they will cancel out the each other effect. And also there is one which is crossing between this one. The, the down ones which are having the negative and negative on the opposite side. So the two nodes are there. But in case of this B1, if you will see the positives are up above and the negative, the, these are the positives down. So only one plane is enough to have positive and positive uh, counterfacing to each other. Therefore, the node is one. And we're looking for the pi fashion, which is giving you the node one. That's why the B option is correct. Also, the other option C, this is also second combination where one node is existing. So C option is also correct. Why not D? Because all the positives are in the same direction. So there is no node. There is no plane which is bisecting. We are getting positive down and positive down. That's why node is zero. This will only form the pi sigma one. Now, this was the fourth question where uh, we need to find out the electron configuration of CP2V. This is a vanadium uh, metallocene complex where uh, we need to firstly know how it, what is the total valence electron combination. So CP ring gives you the five electrons. Vanadium will give you five because its atomic number is 23. So you need to calculate the total valence electrons. And uh, generally we know what is the general electronic configuration in metallocenes? You just have to put your electrons and fill according to the metal orbital capacity. For example, E can have a capacity of four electrons. A can have a capacity of only one electron because one orbital will give you two, here two, 
this is having a combination of two vitals so that's why it can accommodate four electrons similarly here and now why there is two here three over here and one here separately so this is not here this is empty so this comes from your particular chemical uh, method quantum chemical method where you define where the electron electrons have to go to have a certain electronic configuration to have certain stability both of these electrons are there and unpaired electron is in the uh, a1g that is in antibody that is where we find out because any combination could be possible this also is a possible combination this could also be a possible combination where all the three unpaired electrons or the three left electrons are there but two are paired and one is being sent in the antibiotic a1g star now the next question was regarding the reactivity of your ferrocene how it reacts as we have already talked about and seen that uh, ferrocenes and all all the metallocenes they are having a negative charge on their all the carbon compared to the benzene they are having more reactivity towards the electrophilic substitution and uh, don't get worried about what are these three so we have to take into consideration all the three things so firstly this butyl lithium is to activate this particular thing and take up the proton as soon as the proton goes off the butyl uh, thing being an electrophile that comes into picture at this particular position so this happens like this way so firstly in presence of n butyl lithium and so n butyl lithium keeping the temperature very low and followed by your thin butyl chloride the lithium chloride will go out and you will have a combination of sn butyl 3 why is it happening because it is having a negative charge which will uh, the way i will show over here if this is having a negative charge this will attack on your tin and chloride will go back that's why we show over here because h is already out so iron so there is also a combination where di substitution could happen on the opposite sides but uh, it will always give you a combination of three products firstly the unreacted ferrocene would be there which is 30% this mono substitution would be 60% and the di substitution would only be having a percentage of 7% so when you already have the one product which is uh, in less quantity it is not feasible to have the di substitution of this particular thing therefore in the third step when iodine is made to react it will attack on the majorly formed product and therefore it is replaced by iodine is having this and uh, thin and iodide combination will form in other iodide as an electrophile will come as here because this will be having negative this will be positive this will attack over here and this can back attack on your positive species and you will be end up having iodide on your uh, cp so there were many options firstly looking at the butyl lithium there is a possibility of lithiation but we have certain other reactions so this can't be the final product this could be the possible feature if on the butyl lithium up to this second step it has been stopped but with the very less percentage so this is also not the option now last step it is giving iodine so this is having one iodine this is having two substitutions why only the c option because already i told that from this mono substitution iodine is coming which is in 60 percentage for di substitution to happen this seven percentage compound has to convert which is already in less quantity so to from the less quantity to get the di substitution is very difficult that's why the major product that we get is the mono substitution of your id is it clear why di di substitution of id is not occur actually uh, as i told ki this will go step by step firstly with the help of this lithiation uh, and your uh, tin butyl chloride it will give you these three products if you go back and read the lectures of the professor you will get to know firstly this will give you an unreacted some of the ferrocene would be unreacted so this unreacted is having a percentage of 30 so out of the 100 percentage 30 percent is unreacted now the next one which is in major product formation it will be having a mono substitution of this tin butyl this is 60% and the third product that we get is your di substitution oh, okay ma'am <laughs> it is that okay okay i get it 
yeah so when you already have something in less number uh, the formation of the diet substitution even become very less that's why we every time we have to look into the majorly formed product which is the mono substitution i hope this is clear now once you go back to the lectures yes. and try to write in your own uh, way you will get to know about the mechanism if still if you have any doubt you can just ask me uh, in next live session regarding that question okay okay ma'am okay ma'am yeah so now the sixth question is to find out the metal metal bond order in eta 5 c5 this is the complex that has been given and you need to find out the metal metal bond order so to determine the metal metal bond order either you know the structure of the complex and even if you don't know the structure of the complex and if you know the total valence electron that from that calculation also you can see so first was i know the structure for example so i know that it forms a three bonds now from the three bonds the metal metal bond order is nothing but your number of metal bonds two metals are having so this is three but if somebody does not know the structure so we can use the help of your uh, calculation so since we know that this complex is a 36 valence electron why am i saying the 36 because one metal will have an 80 like valence electron since there are two so this will form a 36 valence electron generally it will form and now we need to take all the contributions firstly the c5me is nothing but your substituted cp ring which is having methyl this is sometimes called as cp star so sometimes in paper it is being given as cp star v mean so don't get uh, confused at what is it it is nothing but your substituted cyclopentadiene so we know that cp and cp star both will give you five electrons so five electrons since they are two in number you have we have multiplied it with two this meeting will be in about 10 minutes so uh, if this meeting will get uh, finished in 10 minutes you have to rejoin this link to have other things also but in 10 minutes i will try to finish it off so 5 into 10 then rhenium is belongs to uh, manganese group so it is having seven electrons so seven into two and carbonyl will give you total uh, two electrons so therefore two into three whether it is in bridging form whether it is in terminal form it will contribute only two electrons so three plus x i have added x is nothing but your total metal metal bond how many metal bonds are there and what is the order the number of electrons that are coming uh, from your number of electrons in your metal metal bond order so total is 36 now you have to calculate 10 plus 14 plus 6 plus x is 36 and you will get x equals to 6 6 is nothing but your number of electrons so one bond will form is formed by two electrons three bonds will be formed by six electrons so since you have six electrons therefore the metal order becomes three that's why the answer is three is it uh, fine are you able to understand it if you don't know the structure how do you cal calculate this yeah even if we don't know the structure still we if we know that total how many some of the factors you need to know that uh, this valence electron is 36 if one particular metal will form generally it will give you an 18 valence electrons and if it is been asked to talk about the metal metal bond order you generally take as a 36 valence electron that's why i am showing both the possibilities firstly the structure you know the you know about the structure okay the refi it is three uh, three bonds if you don't know the structure then you need to take the consideration of all the electron contribution like how many cp will contribute how many carbonyl will contribute how many electrons metal will contribute and the last combination how many bonds are there we don't know that's why i have referred it as x and when we calculate it we get to know that x equals to 3 and uh, x equals to 6 and 6 electrons correspond to the three bonds that's why we got to know that metal metal bond order is 3 so either way is possible either you know the structure or you can you can calculate it easily you can calculate if you will go back uh, on youtube and look around the week one live session on week two live session there i have shown how you can calculate the total valence electrons how you can calculate the oxidation state so for that matter you need to do a bit study to get more hold on this so this becomes uh, easy when you uh, try and solve on your own okay so by now yeah uh, by now this is a uh, explanation where you need to calculate the bond order that you can calculate from any method next question is again based on the same thing 
so if you know either about your valence electron or you about your structure if you know the structure then the problem is totally gone but if you don't know the structure then you need to know the total valence electrons and the contribution from each and every thing for example it has been asked that solid state structure of your cp this complex is given which is having a cp and carbonyl now these are the four combination if you look very finely there is no mistake except the number of bonds that they are and how they are arranged nickel are two in number carbonyl are two in number and cp are two in number so you will find it in all the four cases but how do we get to know ki what is the perfect uh, structure that we need to find out so basic thing we need to understand again here also we will talk about the total valence electron since two metal centers are involved so they will be giving a 36 total uh, count and now we need to take all the things into consideration so this is a dimer cp will give you five electrons nickel will give you 10 electrons because nickel is 28 and this is d8 s2 combination we normally talk about d10 so this is a d10 system and uh, carbonyl is 2 while doing a neutral method you do not consider the uh, oxidation state of the metal this is a neutral method when you do consider the oxidation state then everything will be changed hello ma'am if the carbonyl group is bridging uh, it gives two electrons yeah both in case uh, bridging as well as your terminal carbonyl would be two electrons only so there is further chart you have to get back to the reference books where all the ligands and contributions have been given so there are some exceptions for certain cases for example if you have a halogen and if halogen say for example fluorine or bromine if it is in terminal that will give you one electron but if it is in bridging that will give you three electrons how the three electrons for example metal and that are covered in my week second in youtube you will get it and for example cl over here so one it will give one electron and here it will donate its lone pair that's why it becomes a three electron combination whereas in case of carbon it will always give you two electrons whether it is in terminal whether it is in bridging that's why we are taking uh, carbon as a two here okay Okay, miss. Yeah. So five comes from CP. Nickel gives ten, and two comes from carbonyl. And since it is a dimer, we are multiplying the whole as two. Seventeen into two becomes thirty-four. And I don't know how many metal-metal bonds are there between the two. There could be zero also, but I have taken that electron contribution as x. So ultimately, I got I get x equals to two. So x equals to two means two electrons are required to make one bond. So therefore, one bond is existing. So I made a structure. Okay. nickel is here nickel is here and one bond is there one cp with nickel one cp with it now i have two co co how do we get to know ki one co or two co's are uh, uh, the two co's are terminal or uh, the bridging because both options are being given if i found this one this will give you a total valence electron of 18 only that is possible and in this bridging also it is it will give you the same 18 18 on both the nickel centers but here if you see the coordination number nickel is stable in coordination number of 4 which is being formed over here it forms four bonds whereas here it is formed three bonds only that's why this becomes the right option and this is not are you getting my point uh, yeah yes, and also yes. when we are uh, looking at the 3d metals 3d metals are smaller in size so cu is having a tendency it can bridge to the second metal also because it is one metal is here one metal is here if cu is here if it has bond with this particular metal this can bond with this particular metal also because they are very close in contact where the next question come uh here this uh, metal metal bond we have to see now from one single question one one single calculation we can solve the three questions firstly it asked for the question uh, how the structure looks so we got to know that uh, bridging one is a right option now it is asking for the number of metal metal bonds which i have already calculated that there is only one metal metal bond so the answer is p which is one and as i was telling that uh, in case of the nickel nickel the carbonyl is coming as a bridging one but in case of osmium now this is a 5d element here you will find it is asking that what is the oxidation state of the metal so when you will see the structure there is there would be no bridging structure because carbonyl one is so separate or so far apart from the other carbonyl so that this interaction becomes very like less feasible because osmium would be very much bulky 
so carbon is very small so when the bulky uh, the big one is having that co so it will accommodate the whole co and that won't be able to go and uh, meet with the other uh, five p orbitals that's why the distance becomes larger and therefore uh, they would only be only bridging in case of 4d and 5d sometimes 4d will have a terminal uh, bridge uh, terminal uh, bridging also but 3d will have a combination of both terminal and bridging and 5d will only have the terminal one they will not having any bridge so this question was about the oxidation state of the metal now you need either you need to know the total valence electrons or you know the structure of it then you can get to know about this oxidation state since this complex we can calculate it both ways cp is having a charge of minus 1 as i told that uh, to be a or aromatic species it is a six electron when we consider this negative charge so cp is minus 1 osmium we have to calculate the oxidation state carbonyl is neutral so that is zero which is two number and the whole is two and there is no charge on outside so this is zero so the x becomes one so in both the cases osmium is in plus one state because it is having only one metal bond which will not give any oxidation state one cp is connected with one osmium other cp is connected with other osmium therefore because of one cp it is having plus one charge So both the osmiums are in plus one and plus two. Is it clear? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So quickly, we'll take up the last question because this meeting is going to end in um, one minute. So the number of terminal carbonyls in this C, the same complex, and four questions come across: the solid state structure, the metal uh, bonds, the oxidation state, and now they are asking for the terminal carbonyl. So, uh, how many terminal carbonyls are there? In this particular structure, is it any term? Uh, five plus. No, no. Term terminal carbon. How many terminal 